Dana, it's your fault. This episode sucks. <laughs> and you made me do this podcast and made me watch this piece of shit. And now we got to talk about it. Because we're having fun doing it, Dan. <laughs> That's right. I got to remember this is fun. Okay. It's fun. Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast. My name is Dana Smith. And as always, I'm joined by Dan Calzaretta. Good evening, Dan. Dana. Dana. Just seven more days, Dana. Just seven more days. Of dry At- January? Of dry January, at the, at the time it's, of this recording anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's been very dry for me. It hasn't been as dry for you. You've been drinking alternative type of beverage. You mean the non-alcoholic beer? Is that what you mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't have any alcohol, so it's dry. I mean, it's dry, It right? all has it's, a little bit of alcohol. I looked it up, Dana. I Googled, is <laughs> drinking non-alcoholic beer cheating with dry January? And the answer was a resounding no. Wow. Okay. I'm sure Google knows best. The Googler. The Googler. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Batman enemy. The Googler. Yeah. Quick question for you. What did you call a water fountain growing up? Do you mean the kind you drink out of? Yeah. Um, a drinking fountain. In Wisconsin, they call it a bubbler. Really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. What What brings that up? <laughs> <laughs> the Googler made me think of the bubbler. Dana, we need to start drinking. <laughs> 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 On my train of thought, that was perfectly in line. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Um, you keep thinking that. And uh, <laughs> actually, the dry January thing hasn't been bad. I, I haven't been craving alcohol. You know, uh, it's it's been good. So I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to ending it only because I do like beer. Yeah. My wife and I were having uh, steak. And I found I was eating my steak faster. And it's just because usually if we have wine with it, I'll pause, take some of the wine after the steak, kind of savor the flavors. But boy, I was plowing through that steak tonight. I thought you meant because when you're drinking, you're like missing your mouth with the fork. (laughs) It just takes more effort to actually eat the food. I'm not confirming or denying that, no. (laughs) Yeah, let's move on. I'm ready to move on, really. Good. Well, first of all, thanks for all the comments on last week's episode, Errand of Mercy. Not surprisingly, many people really liked the character of Kor, played by John Calicos. Thought that he was a great Klingon, and many people said it was a shame he wasn't able to come back and uh, reprise that character again during uh, the original series. Many people also comment on Kirk's attempt at uh, guerrilla warfare and his uh, kind of burning desire to fight the Klingons. Thanks again, all the Facebook fans and all the different groups on Facebook that allow us to post our uh, information on there. Uh, Somebody always has a comment I learned something about. uh, There's always uh, new information coming around and just some great insight into these shows. And I have some listener comments from YouTube, Dana, that I'd like to share. Julie says about Taste of Armageddon, I don't like this episode. Kirk decides what's good and what's not for those people, and therefore he imposes his will. He may be right, but it's not up to him. And she further says, I'm sorry, but my bad English, it's not my language. Julie, your English is perfect. Uh, That is fantastic. Thanks for sending us that comment. We also heard from Shamrock Particle. Do you think that's his real name? That'd be funny if that was his real name. Uh, Shamrock Particle says about what are little girls made of. I love how y'all go between facts, tangents, and a quip out of nowhere. He especially liked when we were talking about Kirk being duplicated into an android. And I was wondering if you could see Shatner's, quote, giblets since he was naked on the duplication machine. So thank you, Shamrock Particle. And Kingmon01 finally says about Taste of Armageddon, Kirk should have been court-martialed for getting in those people's business. Prime directive clearly means nothing. Nothing. And that is something we have talked about a lot, Dana. And in fact, you had an idea for another count, didn't you? Yeah. The crew of the Enterprise, mostly Kirk, completely ignore the uh, prime directive all the time. And so uh, I thought it'd be a good thing that we should keep track of. But what we would have to do is at least go through our notes from all the episodes and yeah. we'd be able to, I think, recreate a count. What do you think? We'll add that for next week? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> On to uh, this week's episode, The Alternative Factor. Okay, we start off with the Enterprise orbiting around an uncharted planet. The Enterprise prepares to complete its survey when the starship is violently rocked. Not just once, but twice. Everything within sensor range suddenly blinks, almost as if the universe itself is on the verge of ceasing to exist. 
Now, I, I'm going to jump in here for a second. When the ship is rocked, you know, oftentimes in these in the original series, people are like flying one way and then they'll all fly the other direction, right? You know, as the ship mm -hmm. gets tossed about. Shatner was like at the peak of Shatner as Kirk while he was in his chair. I don't know if you noticed, but his arms were up in the air and they were flying one way and then they were flying the other way. <laughs> and it was just like, I was watching that and thinking, this is why people make fun of William Shatner's acting because of a scene like this. Yeah. I, I did notice that. But, and when this whole thing happens, there's like an overlay of like a nebula or something, stars we see. Uh, it's just real kind of fast and faint, but makes you realize something weird's going on. And so Kirk asked Spock what had happened. And Spock says, it's as if the universe blinked. And <laughs> Kirk's reply is, I want facts, not poetry. I have given you the facts, Captain. What you're describing is non-existence. They'd already done a scan of the planet. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, the scan says there's a life form on the planet. You know, before that, though, Spock mentions that the atmosphere is oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, Any first year chemistry student, Dana, knows that that's bad. Hydrogen, yeah, is highly flammable. I mean, the Hindenburg, hello, and then oxygen to feed that fire. One spark, one, I don't know, Spock is pulling down a zipper to take a leak on the planet. Something is just going to light that whole sucker on fire. That's just not going to be good. So yeah. I think it's bad. Bad writing. So, but they had already done a, a, a scan of the planet that said there was no life on the planet. And so right. now there's a, there's a man there. Kirk is, he's kind of testy with Spock. He's like, you just told me a minute ago, there was no life form on this planet. So they decide to beam down to the planet, Kirk and Spock and a security team of four. Now, Dana, when those four red shirts went down, I was really pretty excited. Oh, I was like, yeah, okay, we're going to get at least one. Oh yeah. I was sure that our count was going to go up pretty quick. Yeah, me too. So they, they all beam down to the planet and Kirk spots a ship it's on the ground, some 20 yards away from them, whatever. The bubble top is open. Kind of looks like a flying saucer of sorts. To me, it looked like the ship out of the Jetsons. Yeah, you think you're right. I think of George Jetson, who I was probably expecting to come out of that. Suddenly a man appears and he exclaims, you came. He says, there's still time to stop him. Then the man like looks weary and he collapses. Kirk and the crew rush to him and he is unconscious. The next thing we see is we're back on the Enterprise and Kirk is informed by Lieutenant Matt Masters, that the strange phenomenon has drained the dilithium crystals. And Kirk responds, yes, if we don't recharge the crystals, we'll fall out of orbit in 10 hours. My question is, though, where is Scotty? I, I was going to get to that. Oh, sorry. Because, uh, I'm going to no, rewind. No, that's OK, because I mean, I, <laughs> I, I had the same thought and I thought, well, you know, she's a science officer. And so maybe she's just doing the reporting. But we'll see. She is basically Scotty in this episode. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, Dana, let, let me go back to this guy that they find on the planet. He looks a lot like Jesus as Jesus was portrayed like in movies, right? In old movies and even in paintings. And he talks in these very biblical terms, almost like fundamentalist terms about the end of time is coming and everything, everyone will be destroyed and I'm fighting. Uh, it's a fight against good and evil. I mean, but when they're talking to him while he's on the ground, to me, it, it rang of this very weird uh, fundamentalist religious stuff. Wow. I need to go back to church. I didn't get any of that. <laughs> <laughs> the Enterprise receives a message from Starfleet Command. It's code factor one, invasion status. Now, this is the first time we've heard of invasion status. Yeah. So we did hear, you know, a message from Starfleet in the last episode where they say code one and Kirk says that means war, but code factor one. I'm wondering if we will ever hear it again. My guess off the top of my head is no. Yeah. They were making this stuff up as they went along. Kirk puts the ship on battle station and then a message comes through on the main screen from Starfleet Command. And it's Commodore Barstow. Barstow comments that the effect which seemed to emanate from their area was experienced everywhere in the galaxy. And the Commodore wonders whether they are naturally occurring or if it is an invasion force. They described it as a winking or blinking. Do you remember how they, what word they used? Well, Spock used both blink and wink. And then I think the Commodore said wink. So this is felt everywhere, right? Throughout the entire yeah. universe. And so I wonder if Uranus was winking. You got to set me up for these jokes better. I just, I, <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait, Dana. <laughs> uh, uh, that, 
Oh. Uranus is never going to get old. It just it just isn't. <laughs> Who named it? Knowing that every school kid everywhere was going to have to learn the name of that planet, why couldn't they have named it something else? I mean, if you're going to name it, you might as well name it Big Old Butthole. <laughs> It's not that big, though. Oh, Uranus is a gas giant, Dana. It's, it's a gas giant with a solid core. Oh, shit. How am I going to edit this? <laughs> Good question. That's your problem. Uh, <laughs> so the Commodore says they're evacuating all the personnel and starships in the area and leaving the Enterprise out as bait. Kirk goes to visit the man they found on the planet, and the man is very upset, and he explains that his civilization was wiped out by one man. He refers to him as a thing. He says that thing is pure evil. Kirk says that they will go back to the planet and search for him. The next thing we see is they are back on the planet, Kirk and Spock and this other man. Uh, they find no other beings and no sign of any other life. And Spock says to Kirk, you've been lied to. So this man, who uh, I believe Kirk referenced as Lazarus, asks, why do you take this man's word? Pointing at Spock. And Spock replies, I fail to comprehend your indignation, sir. I've simply made the logical deduction that you are a liar. Does that seem a little harsh for Spock? <laughs> a little bit, I mean, but it was a great line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spock just doesn't seem like that type of person. Yeah, Dana, I don't know when is the appropriate time to, to start on this episode, but I hated this fucking episode from the beginning <laughs> to the end, Dana. I hated it, hated it, hated it. It was stupid in every regard. I think we can just turn the podcast off right now. Don't watch this episode, listeners. It sucks. Wow. Yeah. Um, I've got more to say, Dana. I got more to say about it. <laughs> Well, let's continue on and uh, we'll, we'll dig in further into your hate. Yeah. Okay. But uh, this thing about Lazarus, once again, another biblical reference, right? The yeah. one that Jesus brought back to life from the dead. I wish they wouldn't have brought this show back from the dead. This show sucks. It's horrible, Dana. <laughs> it is actually the spawn of Satan. It's bad. It's very bad. But again, I think this has, there's definitely some biblical terminology, some biblical references in this show. And it's biblically bad. I mean, bad in a biblical sense. Oh, it was uh, Jesus who raised Lazarus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was an altar boy. Did I ever tell you that? I was an altar boy. So suddenly the man is rocked and we see this strange overlap of space and stars over him, just like we briefly did at the beginning of the show. He's yelling. He's like, come at me again. We'll finish it. And, uh, and then Lazarus runs off and Kirk pursues him. Lazarus is beaten down by this force all of a sudden and and then we get this crazy negative look and we see Lazarus battling like another person in this kind of negative world and uh, and then the whole thing spins and Kirk is rocked and then we see Lazarus is back to normal. Dana have I said how much I hate this episode? This is just, it, it encapsulates what you just said makes no sense because this episode makes no sense. <laughs> the whole spinning and the negative look and the positive and the purples and the the weird noises, and it was just stupid. I thought I was having like some kind of withdrawal from not drinking alcohol. I mean, <laughs> I'm starting to think you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little testy tonight. I am. I do not like this episode. Oh God. Uh, and yet we've got a long ways to go to get. Yeah, well, we're gonna, this we're gonna, we're, we're gonna get there. Yeah, but I'm gonna say a few things. Here, I was thinking it was gonna be a boring uh, conversation tonight. I guess I was wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Spock comes up and says the event just happened again from the very spot that we were at. And I was thinking, no kidding. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it's, and then right away, I'm like, it's Lazarus. He's the problem. They well, actually, the Lazarus. problem was the writer of this episode, Dana. <laughs> yeah. And no one on the set thought to say, um, this is not good. This episode is really, really horrible. And, you know, they almost canceled this episode. Well, why didn't they? They should have. We'll get to that. In the All right. Okay. I got more to say, we'll, but I'll hold. We'll get I'll to that off. in Uranus. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hold off, Dana. I'm going to be good. Okay. Yeah. Well, you've been doing such a great job of holding off so far. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if I was drinking, though? I got something to say about this. My rocket. He's our finest. Deep breath. Deep breath, Dan. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. Deep breath. So uh, they look down. Lazarus's forehead is bloody. He yells, I told you it was a thing, a terrible emptiness. Let's get back to the ship. He'll kill us all if we don't kill him first. Kill! Kill! Pretty great dialogue. Yep. I don't know why you don't like this episode. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like the actor. I thought he was quite good. Everything that came out of his mouth, the storyline, if there was one. So here's the deal, Dana, I think. 1967. These guys are smoking some mad reefer in Hollywood, and they come up with this episode. How else can you explain it? Yeah, I can't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Actually, that gives reefer a bad name. Just yeah. say that it's <laughs> marijuana's fault that this episode was so bad. Yeah, you know, that's how the monkeys came up with the movie Head, was they were sitting around smoking pot with uh, Jack Nicholson came up with the idea of turning their TV show into psychedelic trip. Wait, I didn't even know about this. You've never seen the movie Head by the Monkees? N- not by the Monkees. I've probably seen a movie with had Head in it, but... <laughs> And I hope there wasn't monkeys in it. Um... <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. How do we? Yeah. I, um, I so, do not know. I don't remember of any. Go, go find it. Was this their kind of answer to the movie Help by the Beatles? No, no, not even close. No. Okay. It's just like a drug trip. It's, it's like a way to kill their TV show and they completely did it. Did they want to not be on the television show anymore? Is that what? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you watch this TV show, it's so aimed at kids and they were tired of doing the schmuckies type of stuff, you know, goofball stuff. So they took it and it turned it all on its head. Yeah. The show starts off with them, all the monkeys being dandruff in Victor Mature's head. No. No, that's just bizarre. Yeah. See, I'd rather watch that than watch this episode of Star Trek. <laughs> Seriously, when it, when you we're done with the show tonight, go look up head. Look up monkeys head. Well, that even could... Movie. You, okay, <laughs> that might even get me some bad results, Dana. Monkey head movie. <laughs> get like 8,000 results, you know, that say use incognito mode only. And then yeah. let, let's just get this before we move on because we got to move on. The Google term should be... Monkeys head movie. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but it's monkeys, M-O-N-K-E-E-S. Oh, God, that could have been disastrous. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll yeah. report back next week. It's it's a bizarre movie. Wow. Where were we? <laughs> I, I don't know. Somebody was on the planet getting hit from a monkey. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I gotta go watch this show again. <laughs> <laughs> So we go back to the Enterprise as they continue to orbit the dead planet. And Spock explains that the only time the phenomenon occurs is when Lazarus has his confrontations. And McCoy calls Kirk to sickbay. McCoy says, I fixed a cut on his head. And then I stepped out of the room. And when I came back, his wound was completely healed. And Kirk says, well, where is he? And McCoy says... I don't know, Jim. This is a big ship. I'm just a country doctor. See, Dana, again, (laughs) once again, so many things wrong with this, okay? Would you not have had the guy, like, either strapped down to the table or give him a sedative or have, I don't know, a security guard standing there when they think he is the epicenter of all the stuff that's happening to the ship? You just let him walk around? Yeah. And that was a dumbass line by McCoy, too. Dumb. That was the yeah. That might be the stupidest line he's ever said in all of Star Trek ever. <laughs> yeah, it's a complete throwaway line. It's just you know I don't know. This is a big ship, and I'm just a simple country doc. Like oh, uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I just, <laughs> I just work here. You know, that's got, what he's saying. You're right, Dana. It's, this is on my list. It's on the list. I got a whole list of things, Dana. <laughs> yeah, I I stopped on my what's wrong with this show. What's the worst parts? Mm-hmm. Because I, I could have just kept going on and on. Oh yeah. But look at my restraint. I'm not throwing myself into this just yet. I'm waiting for the end. Okay. Okay. Something to think about. (laughs) All right. Okay. I'll try to moderate my comments from now on. So next we see Lazarus. But hold on. One more thing about this fucking cut on his head, Dana. (laughs) What did that mean? So he had the cut, then he didn't have the cut. What does this mean? It, It makes no sense in this scene and it makes even less sense later in the show. Well, they were trying to demonstrate that there's, they're not coming out and saying, but there's two Lazarus. Yeah, I'm, I well, I think it'd be Lazari, but I'm gonna, um, <laughs> I'm gonna take a little bit of exception to that. And when we get to that part, I'll explain my thinking on this whole matter. I've been waiting for you to explain your thinking for a long time. I hear that a lot. So next we see Lazarus.
Lazarus is in the rec room. This is the rec room where they have coffee and play three-dimensional chess. And in there is also uh, Lieutenant Masters. She seems uh, very at ease, sipping some coffee. And uh, assistant engineer comes in and talks to her. And he reports that the dilithium crystals, something, there's a report done on the dilithium crystals. I, I rewound it like three, four times trying to hear what he said. But it's something report on the dilithium crystals. And she says, yes, ready and waiting. And she gets up and leaves. And when he says dilithium crystals, Lazarus like perks up and then he follows out in the hallway, but they're gone. He's like looking around and all of a sudden he has like one of these seizure type things again. Now, so yeah. he's just wandering the ship. There's yep. no, no one knows where he is. He's When he's sitting in the rec room, or nobody like looks at him oddly or anything like that. And when he gets up, one of the guys at the table looks at him like, hey, buddy, you know, it's like they're old friends, you know? Yeah, he gives him this stupid smile. It was totally weird. Like he belonged there. Here's a guy nobody's ever seen before mm -hmm. unless Kirk made some announcement. So Lazarus is kind of like thrown into uh, a tizzy here and uh, we see him in the Starfield image again battling this other person and then all of a sudden he uh, leans against the, the wall. He turns around and we see he has a bandage on his head again. So Dana, God, I'm <laughs> just going to do my best to not swear during this fucking part. Once again, Dana, this part made no sense to me. No sense. Bandage, no bandage. Why is it only the bandage? Why are the clothes exactly the same? Only the bandage is the thing that changes? I, I think you want too much from this episode. I wanted something. We got we got nothing. We got anti-nothing. This whole episode, <laughs> anti-matter, matter, universe, anti-universe. Uh, I needed anti-acid after watching this freaking thing. It's horrible. <laughs> did I mention? Did I mention how much I don't like this episode. <laughs> Yeah, and we're closing in on an hour and okay. we're about a quarter of the way through this. Yeah, show. okay, I, I'm going to stop. So uh, Kirk and McCoy come out of the turbo lift and they see Lazarus looking kind of dazed. McCoy sees the bandage and he pulls it off and we see the scar underneath. And Kirk thinks McCoy is just joking around with him. And then uh, Spock calls to the captain, says, come to the bridge. Kirk takes Lazarus with him and says to McCoy, if I had time, I'd laugh. So on the bridge, uh, Spock shows the main screen and uh, there's something glowing on the planet's surface. Spock says we have located the source of radiation. Kirk asks, how is it the scanners didn't pick it up before? And this is like the third or fourth thing in the show already where the scanners are just worthless. Spock says because it's not there. And Spock says he is at a loss for words. It can only be described as a rip in the universe. Spock says with the help of the dilithium crystals, he was able to localize it. And Lazarus gets all excited and says, yes, yes, that's it. The dilithium crystals, their power, that can do it. He starts begging and pleading and demands that he gets dilithium crystals. And Kirk says, no. Kirk grabs Lazarus and says, I'm tired of your lies. Now tell me what, why you need them. And Lazarus says he must have them in order to destroy his enemy. And he adds, I will have them or your ship and your universe will be destroyed. And Kirk says, don't threaten me. And Lazarus responds, no threat intended. He says, I will have my vengeance. Yeah, that's not a threat. Yeah, that's no threat there. <laughs> and then yeah. he gets on the turbo lift alone and just leaves the bridge. Like, wh why didn't Kirk have him arrested immediately? He just threatened everybody and destroyed the whole freaking universe. Yeah, not just the ship, not just Kirk, not just the ship, the whole universe, yeah. Dana, you are so right. Yeah. And he continues down the hallway and he sees engineering. In engineering, we see Lieutenant Masters is checking the systems. She gets called away and then Lazarus jumps in and knocks out the assistant engineer. Masters around the corner, another room, and she's talking to Kirk. I don't know why there's not an intercom in the other room. See, just add it to the list, Dana. <laughs> Kirk says uh, he he wants an experiment and all dilithium crystals at full power. And she says, I'll check. She goes back in the room and Lazarus attacks her. And uh, I'm going to hold on. going to interrupt you again. Sorry, but <laughs> this is just going to be how this episode is tonight. Um, she's talking to Kirk on the intercom. He comes in the room. She's looking right in that direction. She would totally see him coming at her. And he walks right up. She doesn't hear him. She doesn't see him. Are you kidding me? She's really focused on her work. 
Yeah, I, I know she is. I mean, actually, she was a good character. I would have liked to seen more of that character in the in the um, series. However, again, totally ridiculous. Not not even close to being believable, Dana. I can see why Scotty and Sulu aren't in this episode. They've read the script and went, yeah, NFW, I'm not doing this. Yeah, I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but as she's being knocked out, she's, but she's like, Captain, Captain, and she passes out. Right. And and then back, we go back to the bridge and Uhura says at that very instant that Lazarus is missing. Hello? <laughs> yeah, he's missing because you let him off the freaking bridge. That's why he's, he's missing. <laughs> yeah, who was supposed to be watching him? The, nobody got assigned to him. Yeah, why didn't they assign someone to him? Like a security person I'm trying to remain calm dana i really am but it's going to be evil dan and, and good dan fighting it out in the <laughs> in this podcast about which one's coming out because yeah he's missing yeah you're right he's missing <laughs> so the next thing we see is uh they're in the conference room it's kirk and spock and kirk is questioning lazarus continuity here lazarus beard is like barely there i i mean i at first when they they did kind of a close-up on him i didn't think he had a beard i had to kind of like really strain to see the Oh, that's interesting. See, of all the other things I saw wrong with this one, I didn't even see that one. But we'll put that one on the list, too. I'm I'm adding it right now. (laughs) Well, maybe even the makeup person saw the script. They're like, yeah, um," (laughs) they saw like the first day of filming and they're like, yeah, I'm sick. I'm calling in sick. (laughs) He can do his own makeup. Yeah. 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 Lazarus has a bandage on his head now. And he says it was that thing that stole the dilithium crystals. So Kirk says they will beam down to the planet to check for the dilithium crystals. Next thing we see is on the planet, Lazarus' beard is like super full. <laughs> like uh, the fullest it's been. I mean, the stuff on his chin is just like a, a broom now, but they can find no trace of the dilithium crystals. So once again, Lazarus is rocked and the whole planet is disrupted. Uh, we see the world spinning and Lazarus is at war with himself again in negative form. Kirk and the security team go looking for Lazarus and uh, Lazarus tries to climb down from a rock face. Kirk is below him on the ground 20, 30 feet below him. A rock falls and he he yells out to warn Kirk. Right after he does that, the rock misses Kirk, but he falls 20, 30 feet. Yeah. He fell. So I was expecting him to be dead. I was hoping, (laughs) I was really hoping at this point he would have been dead. And I thought that would have fixed the problem with the show. Yeah. Yeah. So, but not to be. So they get Lazarus back to the Enterprise. He's just waking up in the medical bay. McCoy is there as is Kirk and a security guard. And Kirk thanks Lazarus for saving his life. Then he says he has to ask some questions. And McCoy protests, but Kirk insists. And he says, sometimes pain can drive a man harder than pleasure. Maybe that's a direct line from Kirk's dominatrix. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lazarus says, my spaceship is a time chamber, a time ship, and I'm a time traveler. You think you could like pound that one home a little bit harder? You know? Exactly. Yeah. A, a time ship, a time chamber. I'm a time traveler traveling through time because <laughs> I've got no time. <laughs> I was thinking at that point, I wish I was a time traveler traveling like way past this episode. <laughs> Lazarus passes out and Kirk and McCoy leave. And then shortly after, Lazarus rises up, as he's known to do. (laughs) And he goes through another fit. And then back in the conference room, Kirk and Spock are reviewing the details. And this is actually a fairly long scene because I had to rewind some sometimes. And I was surprised by how long this scene is. Yeah, Dana, it was long. I mean... (laughs) When you have to explain something for five minutes and 12 different ways, Mm -hmm. that's not good writing. And Kirk and Spock conclude that the strange energy must come from a source outside the universe, a source in another parallel universe. Spock says it's almost as if there are two men. What they say is that they are periodically exchanging places through a kind of door or a hole in the universe. Spock says Lazarus must be stopped like two particles of matter and and antimatter meet. They would cancel each other out. Everything everywhere will be annihilated in a cataclysmic matter, antimatter explosion. Yeah, at that point, I was wishing for that. I really was. (laughs) 
Lazarus goes into engineering and grabs dilithium crystal. He kind of sneaks in, right? They don't see him going yeah. in. Yeah. So he goes to the transporter room and the transporter operator says, sir, you're not supposed to be in here. So he basically knees the guy in the nuts. That's exactly what I thought. Too, <laughs> right in the nuts. And the guy doubles over and then he hits him in the back. Yeah. And then he quickly programs a transporter and he beams himself down to the planet. So then we go back and we see Kirk. And he's figured out what has happened. So he goes after Lazarus. And next thing we see is Lazarus is in his ship. Kirk leans in to get Lazarus and he's transported into the negative universe. He sees Lazarus' ship and he goes towards it. And then he sees Lazarus without the bandage on his head. And Kirk learns he is in the parallel universe with the good Lazarus. Good Lazarus explains that if the door is open to the universe, the universe explodes. And if the corridor stays closed, it protects both universes. So they come up with this plan. If Kirk can force the bad Lazarus into the corridor, good Lazarus can hold him there and Kirk can destroy his spaceship, which will also destroy the good Lazarus's spaceship. So basically what happens is the access to the corridor will be sealed forever and both universes will be safe. But the men named Lazarus will be at each other's throats for the remainder of eternity. Kirk goes back to his own universe and we see that Spock is close to Lazarus and there's two security guards on the other side of Lazarus. Kirk kind of motions for Spock to distract Lazarus. Kirk comes down and he attacks the bad Lazarus, trying to wrestle him and throw him into his machine. It's kind of funny because Kirk's wrestling with this guy and he looks back at the guards and says, stay back. And the guards weren't even moving. <laughs> they were just like, they were getting ready to get some popcorn and watch the show. I mean, they yeah, they're like, yeah, this is good. What's <laughs> happening here is good. Finally, there's something good happening in this episode. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll get a ripped shirt off. Maybe. You know? So yeah. Kirk eventually throws the bad Lazarus into the machine and he is transported into the corridor. Next thing we see is uh, Kirk is back on the ship and he gives the orders to activate the phaser banks. He fires on Lazarus's ship, destroying it. And we see the two Lazaruses fighting in the corridor, wrestling each other in the negative corridor. We go back to the Enterprise and Kirk ruminates on the fact that the two Lazaruses are going to be at each other's throats for all of time. How would it be trapped forever with a raging madman at your throat until time itself came to a stop? for eternity and the show is over thank god <laughs> you know he kirk does say to be inside of that you know corridor for an eternity it felt like an eternity watching this episode thank god it's over thank god can we just go home now i need a drink <laughs> You know, we should get some kind of like dispensation, you know, from whoever the higher ups be of this whole dry January thing and say, here are some exceptions. Not only is it okay if you drink, it's required that you drink. If you watch this episode of Star Trek, you must drink because otherwise you will remember what you watched and you'll wonder why. What's the purpose of life? What's the point, Dana? <laughs> Dan. Yeah, Dana. You want to discuss the themes and dilemmas of this show? Actually, there are two dilemmas. My first dilemma is, why would they even green light this episode? Horrible. Should never have even seen the light of day. That's not a real dilemma, I suppose. There is something kind of more serious that I like to talk about. Is that It really is kind of an interesting question about, is there anything outside, and I'm putting outside kind of in air quotes, outside of our universe? Yeah, it's it's been theorized for years, but I, I read something not too long ago that... Uh, uh, scientists do believe that there could be multiple mirror universes. Yeah, and I, I don't really even pretend to come close to understanding how that works. I just love the concept that there could be another you and me in another universe doing another Star Trek podcast, and maybe it's even better than this one. I would find that hard to believe. I would too. I'd actually find that pretty hard to believe. <laughs> My thought at the end of this was, what would we sacrifice to save the universe? Well, that really is a dilemma, isn't it? Yeah. So, Dan, search inside your head mm -hmm. and your soul. Yeah. And is there anything good about this episode? So you want me to dig deep, Dana? <laughs> yeah, actually, there was. I mean, there was one really great part of this episode, and it's when the credits started rolling, because I knew I only had about two more <laughs> minutes before this shit was done. And if I had not been doing Dry January, I would have thought this was an alcohol-induced nightmare. I really would have, Dana. <laughs> 
So that's just, that's that's one of the best things. Uh, How about you? What about a best thing for you? The idea that two Lazarus is fighting for all of eternity. Quite a concept, but that's still a bit of a reach. But it was good. I mean, it's a good attempt on your part, Dana. What are your worst parts? <laughs> and, and let's try to keep it to under 10. <laughs> okay. The whole thing. Uh, <laughs> the acting, the writing, the visual effects. Uh, I just don't know where to start or end. It's kind of like a universe. It's like a multiverse. I have a multiverse of hate on this show, Dana. <laughs> the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. How about for you? Worst part? No, Scotty. All this stuff with engineering, he's nowhere to be found. And, and I had no problem with uh, Lieutenant Masters. Any other specific bad parts or worst parts for you, Dan? We've talked about kind of the biblical references. And this story for me really really is kind of like the story of Lazarus, right? Where we thought he was dead and he came back to life. Well, this show is the same way. We thought it was dead and yet it lived on in syndication, DVD, <laughs> streaming. I think it's time to really kill this thing. Like it should be banned from all wow. platforms. Yeah, that's it. How about you? Now the worst part? Yeah, there's just like a lot of little things in this. And then the the over explanation yes. of, of things. I rewatched that scene of Kirk and Spock in the conference room talking and and at you know, first you're kind of like, oh, yeah, because you're trying to absorb what's going on. Mm-hmm. And then you go back and watch it again. And you're like, wait a minute, didn't they said that? And then they said that he's just repeating himself. <laughs> now he's repeating what Spock said. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is just agonizing when I thought about it. Well, and Dana, this is why our listeners should appreciate you, because you're willing to take it for the team. This could have been emotionally difficult for all of our fans. I would like to thank you, Dana. I have a special note here, to, uh, something about the Lazarus character. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. Do you want to hear this? He was originally supposed to be played by John Drew Barrymore, who is the father of actress Drew Barrymore. Really? And he was originally contracted to play Lazarus. He showed up for conversations about the episode. He even did costume fittings when the show was ready to begin he didn't show up oh so he read the script and he's like i'm out of here i'm not gonna be <laughs> not gonna ruin my career over this crap yeah he didn't have a whole big career so uh <laughs> so at the last second they grabbed robert brown who ended up playing lazarus he had been in several tv shows been around since the 50s he was actually going to be mcgarrett on Hawaii Five O, uh, had signed contracts and everything. At the eleventh hour, the producer changed his mind and cast Jack Lord. And Jack Lord was one of the ones they thought of Captain Kirk. That's right. Wow, it's just all related, Dana. Yeah, so it's like you know, twelve degrees of Jack Lord. True. <laughs> Hey, what happened on this date in history, Dana? The show was broadcast on March 30th, 1967. It had been postponed from February 2nd. I don't know why. I do. I know, because it was so fucking bad. (laughs) (laughs) So on that date, though, CECOM, the Southeast Asia Commonwealth Telephone Cable, inaugurated service at 3 p.m. local time in a ceremony at the Wentworth Hotel in Sydney, making it possible for direct calls from Australia as neighbors in the Pacific, which in turn allowed calls to the rest of the world. The 7,070 nautical mile undersea cable connected from Sydney to Kuala Lumpur. Also on the state, a Delta Airlines DC-8 crashed in the Hilton Inn in three neighboring houses in New Orleans. After taking off from an airport to begin a training flight, a uh, flight was making a practice landing when it stalled and then plummeted into the residential neighborhood, killing 13 people on the ground and all six of the crew on the plane. Also on this date, the Beatles posed with photographic collage and wax figures from Madame Tussauds' famous museum for the cover artwork of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> Dan, do you want to do the count? Yeah, let's do them. This really is another, uh, as far as I'm concerned, worst part of this episode. Um, We'll go through these really quickly. Deb Crewman count. Zero. Stuck at 26.5. Shirtless Kirk, rip shirt Kirk count. Zero. Could have been. Fighting Lazarus a little bit there, but nothing. So stuck at nine. He's dead count. Unfortunately, zero. Yeah. They couldn't count the um, writer being murdered after the episode. So anyway, yeah, uh, zero. So stuck at three. I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. Not an actor in this episode, thank God. Yeah, that's uh, that's what Scotty was saying. Yeah. Uh, there was, fortunately, it's got to be McCoy that says that. He didn't say anything like that. And uh, he was probably trying to get out of this episode as well. We're stuck at two. Supreme being count. Uh, zero. Okay, so zero. <laughs> so we're stuck at five. Next week, we are going to add which count again, Dana? The prime directive count. How many times does uh, Kirk and the crew completely ignore the prime directive? <laughs> 
So Dana, we're coming to the end of this episode. What do we got next week? We have a fan favorite. It's the city on the edge of forever. I mean, isn't it interesting? We're going to go from the worst in the first season, in my opinion, to not only the maybe the best in the first season, but potentially the best in all of the original series. I think the argument could be made for that. Yeah, we're going to go from worst to first. With the next episode, there will only be two shows left in season one for us. That's right. And we've got some exciting news. We'll talk maybe more about it next week. And that is our our wrap up of season one of Star Trek, the original series and of the Damage Gym podcast. Don't worry, we'll be back for season oh, two. We will. That's not the news. <laughs> the news isn't like <laughs> we're not coming back. People are thinking, thank God, thank God they're going to they're not coming back. I won't have to be drinking so much on Fridays. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> We are going to be like Lazarus. We are coming back <laughs> and back and back. All right, Dana. Hey, I uh, even though I was a bit on edge tonight a little bit uh you know hard to hard to hold back my thoughts on this one but uh, i still had a great time so uh thanks once again and enjoy the rest of your week yeah thank you dan uh you made this uh more than entertaining a lot more entertaining than the actual episode was thanks for that and i'm looking forward to next week so live long and prosper thanks once again for listening to damn it jim the podcast we'd love to hear from you please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on Facebook or Twitter. Make sure to join Dan and Dana next week for one of the best episodes of Star Trek ever, City on the Edge of Forever. Have a great rest of your week. And until then, remember to live long and prosper.